everyone and welcome back to When Religion and Crime Collide. I'm your host Lacey Bean and today's case is a mystery filled with sadness and heartbreak. <laughs> Some people use religion as a cover so that they can carry out their crimes, while some people take their religious beliefs to an extreme that results in crime. With that being said, the cases that I cover are not a depiction of all affiliated religions, denominations, churches, and religious people. Now today's case is a little bit of a different one. We're going to be talking about a mystery that is solved to this day. We did figure out what happened, but we're going to be talking about the mysterious life of the woman named Lori Erica Kennedy. Some of you have probably heard of this case. Some of you might not have. I'm going to give you a kind of a deep dive into her life and how we got into this mystery of who Lori Erica Kennedy is. Lori was born October 15th, 1968. And in 2003, while she was attending the Northwest Bible Church in Dallas, Texas, she met a man named John Blakely Ruff who went by Blake. Now, Blake grew up in a very well-prominent family within the Longview, Texas area. Now, Blake's grandparents got started during the oil boom in this area and got very well-established and made a lot of money. Now, Blake's parents were also very well-established. They owned a bank and they owned some real estate. Either they owned stock in the bank or they were like part owners, I'm not exactly sure, or they just owned some real estate or they owned a real estate company. Whatever it was, they did not struggle for money whatsoever. And they were also very well respected within the community. They were actually considered pillars of the community. The family was part of the local country club. The kids went to boarding school. And as a family, they were very close knit. Now, when it comes to Blake, he is described as his personality of not having much of an inner dialogue. He wouldn't think through things that he would say. He would just kind of say it. Or if he was asked a question, he would kind of answer something else. And his brother said that it wasn't that he was trying to be evasive. It was just his kind of personality. And his brother even said he was just different. That's just kind of who Blake was. Now, after Blake and Lori started dating, Blake's family, you know, they're close knit with Blake. So they want to be part of it. They want to get to know Lori. They want to meet her. So they all go out to lunch and they were excited to meet Lori. So they start asking a lot of questions, you know, the typical getting to know you type questions. Well, it was very weird for the family because when they would ask these questions to Lori, she would be very evasive. Or if she did answer a question, it was very little, very short to the point, or she would kind of change topics. So the information that they got from Lori at the end of this lunch was that her parents were dead. She had no living relatives. She was from Arizona and she skipped high school and just got her GED and then attended college. So that was it. Now, after this lunch, of course, the refs are a little suspicious. Blake comes from a family of money. So they think maybe Lori is just with him for his money. And so they were just a little turned off by her and they had just gotten a weird vibe. And the family kind of thought that maybe Blake just was really liking Lori and looking for somebody to settle down with and get married because his brother, David, had recently found a woman, gotten married. Because here's the thing, Blake and David were twins and anything David did, Blake did. So growing up, David got a black Tahoe and then Blake got a black Tahoe. David had just recently met a woman at church and gotten married. And so they thought maybe Blake was just trying to do the same thing that his brother had done because he met Lori at a Bible study at church. So the family with all of their concerns ends up confronting Blake and telling him, hey, we're a little suspicious. She's evading these questions. We're not really sure what's going on. Maybe she's after your, your money, our money. I'm not really sure. But Blake was not having it. He said he would not hear of this from his family. He told them that Lori was just a private person. She had a really bad childhood. She didn't want to talk about it and that she had even told Blake that she had burned all of her childhood pictures. With Blake's personality, he was also the type of person that that would take what somebody said at face value. He never thought there was like this ulterior motive or that there was this hidden agenda. He really took what you said and that's what it meant. So he knew and he believed that Lori wanting privacy was just her being a private person. He took what she said at face value and he believed her and he didn't dig any further into it. Now his family on the other hand, did not respect Lori's privacy like Blake did throughout the remaining part of their relationship. Okay, so this is just my opinion and you can disagree with me if you want, but I think with 
wealth, there comes a lot of privilege with not experiencing trauma in a way that people who live in poor communities do experience it. Now, I don't think that's really opinion. I think that's pretty much fact. Um, it's statistically proven that if you're unemployed, you're twice as likely to have a drug addiction and drug addictions affect and are traumatizing to everybody that's involved, relatives and those who are struggling with the drug addiction. So in my opinion, since the roughs had money and they had that privilege and that they were fortunate enough to not experience traumas that come with living poor or living like just average means, I think that that's why they just went straight to she's after our money instead of actually taking her word for the fact that she said, I had a really bad childhood and I burned all my pictures. Like somebody doesn't burn their childhood pictures for no reason. Can I understand why they would be suspicious at this moment? Yes, but to the degree in which they do not hold space for Lori as the story goes on, that's the part that I really struggle with and that's the part that I really think is because they don't have the knowledge of trauma. You know, they're not trauma informed and they don't have the personal experience of trauma and how it affects you, especially childhood trauma. Wealthy people, it's not to say that they don't experience trauma, and it's not to say that wealthy people can't have fucked up childhoods because they can, and they do. I'm just talking statistically, it's more prevalent within the poor communities, and so in my opinion, most likely they didn't have that personal experience of childhood trauma that maybe Lori did, and so they weren't holding space for her as they were in their relationship and marriage and so on. Now, when it comes to Blake and Lori as a couple, they were very different. Blake was very much that shy, more reserved type person when Lori was very opinionated and outspoken and very bold. And so they, maybe it was like this whole opposites attract kind of thing, but some people did describe Lori more as like, being a lot like Nancy, which is Blake's mom. Now their relationship moved pretty quickly and within just a few months of them courting, if you know what courting is, it's dating, but it's with a lot more rules and it's basically what Christians or a lot of Christians choose to do instead of date. It's basically like dating, but with like marriage in mind, like from the get go. It's not just like dating to date to get to know somebody. It's like, I am courting you because I know one day we're probably gonna get married. So Blake's parents did from the beginning try to talk Blake out of marrying Lori. So you can see again, they're not holding that grace for Lori and respecting her privacy. I can, I will say, understand their suspicions when somebody's evading talking about their childhoods, at least a little bit. But they try to talk Blake out of this, but Blake's not hearing of it and they decide they want to get married and they do. They decide actually to end up eloping at a church where just the priest was there and rumor has it that the roughs were very upset that they didn't get to be there, which I can understand. Like if my child went off and eloped and I didn't get to be at their wedding, I, I'd be hurt. Like my feelings would be hurt. I could understand that, but at the same time, can I understand why they went and eloped? Yeah, because his parents were not approving of this marriage and were trying to talk him out of it. So I can understand both sides. Now, after they got married, Nancy, Blake's mom, wanted to make an announcement. You know, they're pillars in their community. They're part of the country club. Like they have all the to-dos of being part of the you know wealthy, privileged type society within their community. And so a lot of these people make wedding announcements and they put them in the newspaper. That's very, very common, not judgment. Just saying that's very common. Well, she wanted to do this, but when it was made, you know, the announcement that they wanted to do this, and they wanted to put it in the paper, Lori was not having it. She was like, no, I do not want that in the paper. I'm a very private person. Do not put me in the paper. Again, this rubbed the roughs the wrong way, and they were like, mm, what? This was kind of just another one of those things that they were just like, and another thing that's suspicious. They were kind of like, I don't want to say keeping score or keeping tally, but as the story goes on, we will see that they kind of do, they do. And I'm trying to be sensitive to this because I understand their suspicions in a way, but I feel like them not being trauma informed really, really hindered their relationship with Lori. Now, not too long after they got married, it was actually pretty quickly, Lori convinced Blake to move 90 minutes away to a little town called Leonard. Now, Leonard, Texas, very, very small, 2000 people population, I mean, tiny. Longview had 90,000 people in it. So this is vastly different. And 90 minutes is a good distance from your parents. It's not a like, I'm just going to stop by today. It's a, I have to, you know, choose to come and visit you. And it's a whole day process kind of thing. Now, it seemed like Lori was really wanting some distance between Blake's family and their new marriage. Now, I can understand that. Lori 
definitely felt that they didn't like her from the very beginning. They were upset they eloped. Um, they tried to talk Blake out of marrying her, and I am sure Blake did not keep any of this from her. And so I think she was just like, this is our new life. This is my family. I need some distance, which... I totally understand. Now, in Leonard, the couple pretty much kept to themselves. Blake tried to be neighborly, but Lori pretty much just kept to herself as much as she could. She didn't really come out during the day. She worked from home. She was like a marketing consultant, did some mystery shopping type stuff, testing products for different companies or like dining or shopping at a place and then like start, like giving a survey of her experiences. And so she worked from home, so she really wasn't seen during the day. But neighbors said that they would see her at night kind of walking outside the perimeter of her house. I don't know if maybe that was her exercise or just like her nightly routine, but that was really the only time they saw her outside besides maybe getting in her car or running an errand or something like that. But she wasn't really neighborly, kept to herself. It was like she had her family, they were good, and she didn't really need much outside influence or connection. Now in Leonard, the couple did join the fellowship church and they started attending that every Sunday. They're very regular attendees. It is said that Lori used to go to like a mega church. I'm not sure if this was prior to her and Blake's relationship. I am assuming it is prior to Blake's relationship with her. And she stopped going because she's like, it was too much of just like a, a whole production and it was getting off of like biblical principle. And so she wanted something that was more rooted in the Bible uh, think more fundamentalist type views, not to the extreme, but just a little more conservative. There you go. A little more conservative type views. Basically getting back to the Bible instead of the fog machines and the two hours of worship and all of the things, which even though I'm agnostic, um, growing up evangelical, I can, I can understand where she's coming from on that one because the amount of money churches spend on fucking fog machines and stages and lights and this and that and oh lord don't get me started on that okay digressing moving on now when Lori and Blake would go back to Blake's family's house and visit maybe it was holidays or just get togethers or somebody's birthday Nancy Blake's mom said that Lori was always you know on her phone or on her computer she'd much rather be doing that stuff than integrating with the family and making small talk or she'd go upstairs and just like take a nap she wouldn't really go to the kitchen and kind of mingle with other the other ladies or female like family members she wouldn't help in the kitchen cook or anything like that and they saw this as really odd so something else that Lori would do is she wanted to gather all of like Blake's family recipes and she was very interested in his like genealogy and family tree and everything and so they saw it as weird that like she was so interested in theirs but yet she wasn't giving much of her own like history and family tree and things like that now I will say I can understand her not wanting to like integrate and be a part of the family gatherings because you have to admit, Ruffs, you were not accepting of her pretty much from day one because you felt like she was a little suspicious and so you didn't integrate well with her. You made it very well known that you didn't like her and you tried to convince your son to not marry her. It was very evident in my opinion that you didn't like her and so I can't see myself like wanting to be BFFs with a family that doesn't like me. So they saw this as odd. They saw this as maybe rude, I would assume. I, I don't see this as odd. And the reason I don't see it as odd is because you already know, she's already made it known to all of them that she had a really bad childhood and that so much so she burned her childhood pictures. Like that, that she told Blake at the very beginning and Blake told his parents. So they know this. They know at least that she is saying, okay, so maybe they don't believe her, but she has told them she has had a bad childhood and she burned all her pictures. So I can understand her coming into this family and knowing and seeing how close-knit they all are, wanting to know more about their family, wanting to know more of their genealogy, wanting to know the family recipes, and maybe even though they didn't like her, maybe what she was doing was trying to integrate that and those pieces of Blake's family into her family as they move forward in their marriage. I don't know, I could be wrong. That's, that's just my opinion, a theory. Now, after they got married, one of their main goals was to get pregnant. They wanted a baby super quickly, and they that was goal number one for them. Well, unfortunately, Lori struggled with some fertility problems, and she ended up having four miscarriages. I don't know if you've ever had a miscarriage. I have not, but I have. I know people who have, and they are 
heartbreaking. I know people who've had multiple miscarriages and it is absolutely heartbreaking. And there's a lot that goes into maintaining a pregnancy. And one of the worst things is stress. And I can imagine that Lori was probably pretty stressed during this time. She's in a new family, the family doesn't like her and she's being evasive and so it, it, it's evident that she's hiding something or at least she doesn't want to talk about something so that's probably adding another level of stress in this moment and I don't know if that played into her fertility but instead of the family coming and like supporting them which maybe they did maybe they did come and support and show their love but with her having all of these miscarriages they automatically assumed that she was probably older than what she was claiming they had been told around this time that Lori was about 34 35 years old now unfortunately Lori struggled with infertility fertility for four years, but in 2008, she was actually able to get pregnant through IVF and she gave birth to a little girl. Her and Blake were over the moon excited. They absolutely loved this little girl and they were seen as wonderful parents. They doted on this little girl and Lori absolutely loved her and she would do anything and everything for this baby. She even took this baby to do like little tea parties where she'd wear a little hat and get dressed up and do tea parties with her daughter and she just absolutely head over heels in love with her child. On the other hand, Lori was also seen as overly protective of the baby. She wouldn't even let Nancy like hold the baby. If she needed to even like go to the bathroom while she was at the rest house, she would take the baby with her while she went to the bathroom instead of just letting somebody else watch her. She was overly protective. And this was really hard on the roughs because they were baby people. They said, we're baby people. We want to hold a baby. We have other family members who have babies. And so for her to be so overly protective and not even let them be involved, even just a little bit, it, it was heartbreaking for them. They would try to come to Leonard and visit, but a lot of the times Lori said no. And if they did come visit, if they were able to come and visit, Lori would never leave them alone with the baby. She actually trusted nobody besides her and Blake with that child. Now because of Lori being so overly protective of the baby and not letting the roughs be involved even a little bit, it really started to make that tension between her and the roughs grow exponentially. The rough family felt like she hated them and in reality she probably did. Like she really didn't like them. They they had this tension from day one and now she's being overprotective. So she really doesn't like them. And it was evident. Blake said that she would just start complaining about his family when they did nothing wrong. She would just start complaining and start complaining and start complaining. So I think her own resentment towards his family started to grow more and more and more as the years went on. Now this tension really started to weigh on Blake. You remember, he grew up in a very close-knit family. They were always together. They did things together. They were loving. It was it was a great family unit. And so now you have this animosity, this, this tension, this stress. And Blake is a very, you know, just down-to-earth type person. And so this weighed on him so much and he couldn't handle it anymore. And on Father's Day of 2010, he told Lori that he wanted a divorce and he left the house and he moved back in with his parents. Not long after he moved back in with his parents, he filed the paperwork for a divorce and this was absolutely crushing to Lori. She loved Blake with her whole heart. She loved her family deeply and this kind of just started to make her spin and spiral out of control. Blake and Lori tried to split their time evenly with the baby and just, you know, swap her back and forth. This took a major toll on Lori's mental health because as we know, she was a very protective parent and she would not leave the baby alone with his family at all whatsoever. She needed to go to the bathroom, baby was with her. Now she's having to be forced to separate herself from her baby for days on end. Not only that, I'm sure she's thinking, Blake's gonna leave her alone with his parents and she didn't want that, whether we agree with that or not. She, I'm sure, was stressed out about that fact because she was now out of control. Something that she had controlled for so long was now out of her hands and she just, she couldn't handle this and she started to spiral. Now, Danny, one of their neighbors, Lori and Blake's neighbors, was actually a pastor of a church and they actually tried to do marriage counseling with him. Now, sometimes it was just Lori that would show up for the counseling session, sometimes it was Blake and Lori, and then sometimes, oddly enough, it was Blake and David, his brother. And Danny said that at these meetings, sometimes, like a lot of the times that when David was there, David would speak for Blake and 
David said that it was because Blake couldn't really explain his emotions very well, so David did it for him. Um, but Danny did say that he saw this as odd and sorry, but I, I agree. Now, for the most part, these counseling sessions were just Lori. Danny said that she would bring in notebooks after notebooks of all her writings, just writings upon writings upon writings, and she would constantly talk about how she needed to fix herself, and she would talk in circles. She would say one thing, and then before she was even done with it, she would start back over and like say the exact same thing, and she would always fidget with her hands. You could tell she was very uncomfortable. She was stressed and overwhelmed. It was just hearing Danny explain how she was in these sessions made my heart just break because I can tell that she is literally mentally breaking down. Now she told Danny that she felt like it was Blake's parents that were behind this whole thing and that they just wanted to convince Blake to divorce Lori so that they could cut her out of the picture and that they could be involved in the baby's life. She would also go from being very nervous and jittery to speaking very monotone in the same session, just kind of flip-flopping back and forth. And when she would go to these moments of being monotone, she would say things like, Blake left. I just need Blake back. I need my family together. Now, in my opinion, as somebody who is trauma-informed, I can see her going from jittery to monotone, going from nervous to saying these like affect type statements and also speaking in circles. I can see that as something where she's trying to suppress her emotions. When you're speaking in a monotone voice, that can be a sign of like suppressing your emotions. And it's very evident that Lori didn't know or understand at least to a degree how to understand her emotions and process through them. That's why she was highly overprotective. That's why she created so much distance and was very evasive. She didn't know how to understand and sit with all of these uncomfortable feelings and so she needed to suppress them. That is my opinion as somebody who is trauma informed. I could be wrong but that's my mm, assumption. I want to know what you think so comment below. Now Lori is not only spiraling out of control but she is becoming unhinged as the weeks go on. She starts sending hateful messages and texts to uh, Blake and his family and not only that when they tried to do their custody exchanges She would cause a massive scene and just make it ten times harder for everybody involved now with this tension rising the, Everybody's kind of on edge and one day Nancy hears like the back gate swing open outside But she never heard like or saw anybody like come in the house But a few days pass and they realize that they're missing a house key So their first assumption is that Lori snuck into the house stole the house key and that she was gonna come and do something Now yes, Lori is becoming unhinged so I can understand where their fear is coming in this moment So they do end up filing for an order of protection against Lori and it was granted now Christmas of 2010 just I think it was like the day or the day before or a few days before Christmas Lori knew that the baby was not going to be with her for Christmas and Blake wasn't either and she was having a really hard time wrapping her head around that and people had noticed that over the last handful of months she had started to lose weight the baby had started to lose weight and things were not looking good now, Blake had the baby at his parents' house around Christmas, and so Lori actually went over there, and she started to make a huge scene, and she started to demand that Blake and the baby come back with her, and they be reunited and spend Christmas together. Now, of course, Blake refused, and because she was causing such a scene and losing it, they ended up having to call the cops and have her removed from the property. Now, on Christmas Eve of 2010, Blake's dad woke up, and he went outside to get the new newspaper. When he opened up the garage, he noticed a car parked in the driveway with its lights on and he realized that the car was Lori's. So afraid that something would happen or that she was there to, you know, harm one of them, he quickly shut the garage door and he called the cops. Cops show up and they notice that the car is on and so they approach the vehicle. When they approach the vehicle, they see Lori in the front seat, dead, to a gunshot wound to the head. She had driven her car all the way to Blake's parents' house, parked in their driveway, and took her life. With Lori still seat belted into that car, she chose to end it all because the stress of not being with her family anymore was too much. And she mentally couldn't handle life here on earth without her baby and without Blake. The cops look in the car, they see blood splatter all over the dashboard, 
In the passenger seat, they ended up finding two letters. One was marked to Blake, my wonderful husband, and the other was addressed to her daughter. Then it was instructed that the child not read the letter until she was 18. Now, the majority of these letters have not been released. I think the one that she had written to Blake was like 11 pages long, and the police stated that it was, quote, the ramblings of a clearly disturbed person. In the letter to Blake, Lori said that she didn't want to die being divorced from Blake and she couldn't handle that. And so she chose to take her own life before the divorce was final so she could technically die still being Blake's wife. In the letter, she also made it very clear that she didn't want anybody else cleaning out her house except Blake. Nobody else go in there and clean it out, just Blake. Lori Ruff was laid to rest on January 3rd, 2011. Now, even though Lori had said that she wanted Blake to be the one to clean out the family home in Leonard, Texas, he didn't. Blake could not bring himself to step back into that house. He was not gonna do it. And so, his family went to clean out the house. But Miles, Blake's brother, and a few other family members, not only decided to go and clean out the house, but they were very eager to go clean out the house because they knew that she was hiding something and they were gung-ho on revealing whatever it was. It was kind of like them wanting to be like, ha, I knew it, gotcha, kind of moment. Now, they claim that the reason they wanted to find out whatever it was that Lori was hiding was that they wanted to be the ones to be able to tell her daughter when she got older and her not be blindsided by something. In my opinion, I think they had worked it up in their head that she was this like mastermind criminal and that she was like running away from a secret life of crime and they wanted to be the ones to like uncover that and kind of, like I said, have the, ha, I knew it, gotcha kind of moment. Now, when they did get to the house, Miles was nervous that Lori had booby trapped it and so they ended up calling the cops so that they could come and kind of like clear the scene before they went into the home. Now, I've seen some people criticize them for doing this, but you have to understand Lori was very unhinged um, in the weeks leading up to her taking her own life. She was threatening them. She was sending them texts. She, they like So much so that they got an order of protection against her. Um, she was causing a scene. She was barging into their house. They thought she had stole a key. I can understand where their worry had come from. Uh, I don't know that I would have thought booby trapping, but also I wasn't there. So I, I am not going to judge them for calling the cops and wanting to clear the scene. It was It was a very tense time for everyone involved. Now, when they got into the house, it was a mess. There were dishes piled up everywhere. There was trash everywhere. There were piles of clothes everywhere. Even the baby's crib was disgusting. And they said that they had found like writings where she had literally wrote like on a paper and then just kept writing on top of that. Like wrote your note and then on the same piece of paper, write right on top of it. And so it, in my opinion, um, I think she was deeply, deeply depressed. Um, if you're suffering from depression, then you know how hard it is to get up and just do the mundane tasks of like brushing your teeth, much less cleaning your entire house. So to me, this screams that she was in the depths of depression in this moment. That is an opinion, not a diagnosis. Now, Blake had told his family that there was this lockbox in the closet that was labeled crafts and he knew it was there. Lori had told him about this lockbox and she had told him that this box was her private stuff and to never open it. And Blake respected that. I will say kudos to him because uh, I could never. I mean, the first time my husband would have been out the door, I'd have been breaking that motherfucker open and wanting to see what was inside. My nosy ass and I, anyone else? Like, I cannot believe he didn't open this box. Like, respectful to respect her privacy, but what you hadn't for me. I would have been curious as fuck. Tell me in the comments if you would have cracked that open or not, cause I would have. But Blake was a lot nicer than me. He didn't open it, he let it be, but he did tell his family about it. Now Miles, when he walked into that house, he went straight to that closet. He went straight to that lockbox. He grabbed a screwdriver and he broke that thing open. Now, when they opened up this lockbox, they ended up finding a lot of documents. And these documents were very revealing on who Lori might actually be. And they actually said, Miles said, that everybody exclaimed, bingo, when they opened this box. And so, like I said, they were very eager to go to this house and discover who Lori really was and what was the secret that she was hiding and why was she so evasive on everything. Now, inside this lockbox were many documents that revealed the mystery of Lori Ruff Kennedy. Well, 
some of it. Inside, they found an Idaho driver's license that had the name Becky Sue Turner on it with Lori's picture. Then they found a birth certificate with the name Becky Sue Turner, a bunch of scrap paper with random names, numbers, and notes on it, and a reference letter from a Roger Steinbeck written on stationery from a five-star hotel in Thailand. It was kind of like an employment reference type letter. And they even found documents that had showed that Becky Sue Turner had changed her name to Lori Erica Kennedy. Now, with the Ruffs feeling very vindicated that they knew Lori wasn't who Lori said she was, they were ready to just peel back the layers of this entire mystery and figure out the why. Why did she change her name? Why was she hiding? Was it crime related? Was she part of a cult? What, what was going on? Now, actually, right next door lived a private investigator. So they went over and they ended up hiring the private investigator to do some digging. Now, after some digging, the private investigator, they found Becky Sue Turner. She was a dead two-year-old. Yeah, they had found in a newspaper in 1971 that Becky Sue Turner had died in a house fire uh, along with a couple of her other siblings at the age of two years old. Now, we know that Lori Erica Kennedy wasn't even Becky Sue Turner. So who was she? So they're at the ends of their rope. They don't know how to do any more kind of investigating. So they reach out to some of their friends. They got major connections um, with like a congressman, man, someone. And that person ended up connecting them with a man named Joe Velling. Now, Joe Velling worked with the Social Security Administration. He did investigations for like uh, credit card frauds or like stolen identities. And so he was able to come on and start doing some investigating and figuring out who Lori was in reality and what kind of scam maybe or crime was being committed and kind of connect the dots for everybody. He thought when he took on this case, this is just an open and shut kind of case. It's going to be really simple. Do this research, this research, connect this dot to this dot, bing, bang, boom, tie it in a bow and we're good. No, nope, nope, not Lori Erica Kennedy. That is not the case with her because he quickly, quickly realized that he was gonna have trouble for years, unraveling this crazy mystery of who this woman really is. Joe was able to like piece together some of Lori's timeline prior to her meeting Blake, but he could not make any more connections to her timeline prior to 1988. He said that Lori was so good at hiding her prior identity that she was either A, a criminal mastermind, or B, she had help. Now, it's speculated that Lori ended up using the new paper trip handbook. We've talked about this in another case, the one with um, murder of James Matheny. So this book was written in the 70s and birth certificates and death certificates weren't really like cross-referenced. And so it made it very easy if you could find somebody who had died at a young age and was born in one state but died in another state. So their birth certificate is from like, let's say Oregon, and then their death certificate, let's say is California. So those states aren't cross referencing, so they're not realizing that like, oh, this person was born, but oh, also this person is dead already. Also, during this day and age, it was really easy to get a birth certificate. You just basically like sent in a letter and said, I am so-and-so and I need my birth certificate. And so she was able to obtain Becky Sue Turner's birth certificate just by like sending in a letter. She didn't need to show all this documentation or get anything like, what is it, uh, notarized. So in May of 1988, Lori requested in Bakersfield, California, the birth certificate of Becky Sue Turner. In June of that same year, 1988, Lori ends up getting a driver's license in the state of Idaho with the name Becky Sue Turner. In July of 1988 in Dallas, Texas, she ends up changing her name legally from Becky Sue Turner to Lori Erica Kennedy. She also gets a Texas driver's license and a social security card under this name. Now, social security cards, like I've said in that other case with uh, James Matheny, Social security cards were issued back then very different than the way they're issued now. Right now, you get your social security number and your card when you're born. Back then, it was pretty common to not get your social security number until you started working. So until you started applying for jobs and doing that whole shenanigans, then you didn't really need a social security card, so they didn't issue it until you needed it. So she didn't need it until around this time, so it didn't seem weird that she's filing for a social security card. 
In 1990, Lori ends up getting her GED from a local community college there in Dallas. And then in 1997, she ends up graduating from UT of Arlington with a degree in business administration. Now, as Joe Veling is doing his research and trying to make all these connections, he realizes that Lori ended up having a ton of different P.O. boxes within like different states. And so basically what would happen is if mail was sent to her, it would go from one place to another place to another place until it was finally rerouted back to her in Texas. Now this was as far back as Joe Velling could make it. 1988 where she files for Becky Sue Turner's birth certificate. That's as far back as he can go. He can't figure out anything else before that. So the only thing he has at his whims are, you know, the software to try to run some things through. So he runs her fingers prints, fingers prints, fingerprints through the system thinking that maybe with her changing her identity, it's criminally related, like she's running away from some kind of crime. So he runs her fingerprints through the system. Nothing, nothing, not a ding, ding, doom. So then he runs her facial recognition because there were some people that were thinking maybe she's like a spy or something like that. Nope. Facial recognition got no hits. Joe thought maybe Becky Sue Turner is our key. Maybe she knew Becky. Maybe she grew up with Becky. Maybe they'll recognize her. Maybe. Maybe. So he goes and talks with Becky Sue Turner's family and they were just as shocked as Joe Velling and everybody else. He, They had they had no idea who this woman was. They had never seen her before and she had no connection to their family. Now, they were able to talk to a few of Lori's friends that she had made while she was in college in Dallas, but they said that she really much, like kept to herself like she did in her adult life. So they didn't know much about her. They did track down one of her ex-boyfriends, and he said that there, you know, there was not much he could say. He had not really like contacted her or been you know, seen her since their breakup, but the last thing he had heard was that she was dancing at a gentleman's club um, somewhere around like Dallas-Fort Worth area. Now, when this news got out to everybody else who knew Lori, Erica Kennedy, they were very shocked. Like, how, why, what? Because she was very religious, and it seemed like that had always been her thing. She had always been religious, and so she would always dress modestly. She was, you know, didn't go to that big mega church. She wanted to go back to, like, biblical principles and more conservative-type views. So this was very shocking to everybody. Um, Maybe her conversion to Christianity was a little bit later in life, and so she needed to get by, so she did dancing at a gentleman's club. No judgment for me, none whatsoever, but it did shock everybody. And when they did do the autopsy of um, Lori, they ended up finding breast implants. And so this, not that this 100% supports the theory that she was a dancer at some point in time or the rumor. Um, It could, it could, it could not. I know many women who have breast implants that are not dancers, so it could go either way. But they thought, bingo, serial numbers, we can track her by that, but... She didn't get the breast implants until she was already Lori Erica Kennedy. So it just came back as Lori Erica Kennedy. So again, no answers. Now on one of these papers, it had in Hollywood, like North Hollywood police. And then it also had like a lawyer's name, Ben Perkins. And so Joe Velling did some research with that and started digging in, trying to see if like maybe she was his client. And so when he talked to Ben Perkins, he actually hadn't been practicing law for a handful of years. And he had never had a white client. He had only seen, um, had people of color who were his clients. He even tried to track back that like employee reference type letter from a Roger Steinbeck that was written on like the Thailand resort hotel kind of paper. But when he dug into that, they realized that Roger Steinbeck was a fake person. And so it was just a fake employment reference for her to try to hopefully get a job. Now they had been searching for Lori Erica Kennedy's identity for over a year now, and they were coming up to every dead end possible. So what Joe Velling decided to do was to take her DNA and to submit it into the National um, Missing Persons database and to submit it to Ancestry DNA or Ancestry.com, hoping that someday maybe some of her lineage would pop up together and then they could kind of piece together who she was. But that was all they had left to do. They couldn't research anymore. They had done every avenue that they could think of and they were coming up empty. And so being at the end of their ropes, they decided it was time to go to the media. And this was in 2013 when he went to Seattle Times and told the story to them and they wrote their very first piece of 
Lori Erica Kennedy and the mystery of who she was. Now the mystery of Lori Erica Kennedy was absolutely perplexing for everybody. And so that captivated many people's attention. And so everybody that is any what any somewhat related to true crime, whether they consume the content, they create the content, whatever it may be, they were fascinated by the story and they really wanted to help try to figure out the mystery of who Lori Erica Kennedy was. And so there it went and it caught on like wild fire people are talking on reddit people are talking on other forums and everybody's pitching in to try to figure out who this woman was there were some crazy theories maybe she was in witness protection maybe she was a spy maybe she had escaped a cult maybe she had committed some crazy crime and even some other wild theories they even thought that she could be tara calico if you don't know who that is she is a missing person who it's still to this day is a missing person and she is the girl that's in a picture that was found at a, a gas station and they thought that Lori erica kennedy was Tara Calico, but that was found to not be true, but that was a theory that went around for a really long time. Now the case had pretty much gone cold or at least like had no movement in it for a really long time, for a handful of years. That is until Colleen Fitzpatrick decided to approach this mystery with science. Colleen Fitzpatrick was a nuclear physicist who had turned forensic genealogist. And so she requested a DNA sample from Blake and Blake and Lori's daughter. And what she did was she was able to take the daughter's DNA and Blake's DNA, and then she took Blake's DNA and compared it to the daughter's DNA and so that she could eliminate Blake's DNA out of her daughter's DNA, their daughter's DNA, and then just isolate Lori's DNA out of their daughter's DNA. And then with that DNA sample, she was able to start kind of piecing together and trying to find matches through her like family tree. Now, I know that Joe Valling had already put in Lori's DNA into like the national missing persons database thing and ancestry.com. So I'm not sure why Colleen Fitzpatrick wasn't able to get that DNA sample. I'm not sure why she had to go through Blake and Blake's daughter. That part I don't really understand. I'm not connecting the dots. Somebody maybe explain it to me in the comments. But anyway, she was able to get the DNA, isolate Lori's DNA, and then start trying to build her family tree. Now this took her a very long time and she spent hundreds of hours trying to piece this together. And this is what she found. She was really good at doing this. She was able to help like relatives find their families, whether they had been like adopted. And so like helping adoptees find their biological parents. She even helped Holocaust survivors find family members. She was even able to identify a child that had died on the Titanic just by going back through his like family ancestry DNA and building the tree, she was able to identify him. So she was really good at this, but it is hard work and it takes a lot of time. So she spent hundreds of hours trying to piece this together. Now at first she was able to find some relatives of Lori, but they were very, very distant cousins. And so they wouldn't be able to like actually give her any information or have any connection. Like I can't tell you who my third fucking cousin is. And so that she knew that was gonna be a dead end. So she didn't even really like go down that route and then one day she got a hit that there was a first cousin named michael cassidy so they tried to reach out to michael multiple times through the ancestry.com or the dna database they tried to send a message on that platform they sent multiple and he didn't respond to any of them they say that they don't even think he got the messages which i totally understand because i have family member like my dad his sister like got all their dna and sent it all in and they like she created an account for all of them my dad can't tell you when the last time he probably signed into that account and so he probably did his ancestry stuff he checked it a couple times learned about it and then never checked again i think that's probably 70 percent of people who get their DNA tested. Now Michael Cassidy is also a very common name so they couldn't like narrow it down to like who the right Michael Cassidy was. They only had his name. They didn't know where he lived. They didn't know anything about him except his name. So there was no possible way to filter out who the right one was. So they were forced to wait. Now after a few years another connection was popping up that was a third cousin. Now it was still too distant for her to like really learn anything about Lori but it was enough of a clue to give her some hints about the family tree. So she took that third cousin and she worked back that third cousin's ancestry tree and then 
filed it back to a great great grandfather where then she was able to work back down and she made a connection through that family tree and through that great great father to Michael Cassidy. Through those she was able to use like the internet and Facebook and social media and things like that to look up the people in the areas that they lived and piece all of this together. It's wild. I don't even know how they did it all. It sounds very confusing and absolutely time consuming, but she was able to narrow it down to the correct Michael Cassidy. And with having the correct Michael Cassidy, she was able to use like obituaries, again, social media and a private investigator to then build off Michael Cassidy's family tree. And then she was able to, what she thought she believed was the aunt of Lori, that Michael Cassidy's mom was Lori's Aunt. Colleen Fitzpatrick then gets all of his information. She gives it to Joe Veiling and immediately Joe ends up flying out to Philadelphia because this is not a conversation. You just like call somebody up and be like, let me tell you a wild story and then ask you another wild question. <laughs> so he didn't go to Michael Cassidy's um, like house or place of employment. He didn't question him. He actually went to a different family member and I'm not sure who it was or why he didn't go to Michael Cassidy, but he went to a different family member. He went to their place of work. Now he approached them and he asked them if they were the correct person. They said yes. And he's like, can I tell you a story? He's nervous because he's like, this is a wild story and I don't know how they're going to take this. And so he just starts spilling his guts, telling the story of Lori and trying to see if they have a connection. And the lady is kind of confused, which rightfully so that is until he pulls out the picture of Lori Erica Kennedy. And the lady goes, Oh my God, that's Kimberly. Kimberly McLean grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and she was born October 16th, 1968. She was actually less than a year older than Becky Sue Turner. So her age was very, very close to Becky Sue Turner herself. So she really wasn't lying about her age. Lori went to Bishop McDebit High School in 1983, and then her senior year, she up and vanished. It's so sad, but a former classmate actually said that nobody noticed. Lori really kept to herself, and so when she wasn't around anymore, nobody noticed she was gone. After graduation, another classmate had heard that she had just moved to a different area of Pennsylvania and that she had called her mom and said that she was safe, she didn't want to be found, and that she was just now living her own life and basically disowning her own family. While her family didn't call and file a missing persons report, she at this point was 18. She could go off and run away if she wanted to. She was legally an adult and so the police couldn't do anything even if a missing persons report was filed because if she wants to run off and not have any connection with her family, that's her right to do that. Family claims that they have no idea why she left, that it was very confusing for them. But what's weird to me is I don't see or nobody has shared that they actually like tried to locate Lori at all whatsoever. In 2016, when all of this is coming out and we're realizing who Lori Erica Kennedy is, the mother, her mother Deanne, did not want to talk to media at all. But another family member, an uncle, did choose to talk to the media. He said that the family had no idea why she ran away, that it was very confusing because the children had a wonderful childhood. The mom was a stay-at-home mom. The dad was a volunteer firefighter and they went on family vacations and he would give them rides on the fire truck and all of this wonderful, beautiful stuff. They had a wonderful family. So why did she leave? It was a mystery to everybody. But a lot of other people painted a very different picture. So there was a woman named Teresa Montgomery and she was actually like one of Lori's classmates when she was in fifth grade. And she said that when she went over to Lori's house that the atmosphere just basically felt very different. That the family had no kind of like camaraderie together. There was no kind of connection with each other. And she said it felt very different in Lori's house with her family than it did at anybody else's house that she went to, like all of her other classmates or friends. Also a neighbor, her name was Louise, was a family friend of Lori and her entire family. She had a daughter that was close to Lori's sister Michelle's age and so they played a lot together. She said Lori always tried to keep to herself. She played by herself a lot and she just was, you know, kind of a loner basically is what the vibe I was kind of getting. And she painted the picture that Deanne and Jim, the mom and dad, had a very dysfunctional marriage. Apparently Jim was an alcoholic and he was very controlling. Louise said that Deanne had no freedom whatsoever and she even told Deanne that she thought that her relationship with Jim was very toxic and that she should probably leave. 
Well, there's no evidence that there was any physical abuse, but the neighbor did say that with him being so controlling and being an alcoholic that she didn't think it was very far-fetched that there could have possibly been some kind of physical abuse going on, but that is her opinion. That was never something that's been proven. One day, Deanne and the kids are just gone, and she comes back a few years later and tells Luis that she had actually spoken to her pastor and told him about all her relationship with Jim and how awful it was, and he actually advised her that she she needed to leave the marriage. She needed to get her stuff in order, get money and escape without him knowing. So to me, that screams that there was way more abuse going on than just him being an alcoholic, controlling husband. I think there was more um, abuse, whether that was emotionally, physically, sexually, I don't know. But to me, it seems a little more than just an alcoholic controlling man. But she took the advice of her pastor and she got her stuff together and then one day in the middle of the night she left with the kids. A few years after she left she ended up marrying a man named Robert Becker. They got married and lived in a different town in Pennsylvania and that's where Lori and her sister Michelle ended up going to the high school, uh, Bishop McDevitt High School. Now the uncle thinks that the reason that Lori ran away is that this new life that her mom and them were creating in this new town with the stepfather was something she couldn't like wrap her head around or adjust to all of the differences and so she ended up running away. That was the only reason that he himself could come up with, which I could understand if there was no knowledge of any other kind of abuse. Um, and there is no knowledge. We don't know. We can assume, um, we can speculate, but there is absolutely no proof at all that there was any other kind of abuse, whether that was from her real father or her stepfather, or another family member, or somebody else we absolutely do not know. Now, Kimberly ended up vanishing in 1986. A year after she vanished in 1987, her dad, Jim McLean, ended up passing away. Now, when he died, he left his estate to his two daughters. It ended up totaling about $84,000 for each daughter. Now, in today's money, in 2023, that's about $222 thousand dollars. So you can imagine how getting $84,000 would be life changing. Well, she had already ran away, so nobody knew where she was at. But it's really common for whoever is involved in taking control or dispersing somebody's estate after they die to track these people down and they'll even hire private investigators if need be. Well, they ended up finding Lori Kimberly, and she was living in a town in Utah, but she was still going by Kimberly, so it wasn't too hard for them to end up tracking her down. So they sent her a letter informing her that her father had passed away, that he had left his estate to both of the daughters, and that she was supposed to receive $84,000. So basically, like, contact us so you can get your money. Now, she never collected that money. $84,000 thousand dollars. It would be like us getting a letter today saying, hey, so-and-so died and left you two hundred and twenty two thousand dollars. Come get it. Do you know what I could do with two hundred and twenty two thousand dollars right now? One, pay off my school debt. Two, pay off my house. Ah, she didn't take that money. You know what she did? This was in 1987. By 1988, she was changing her identity. Now, she didn't change her identity until like uh, she started it in May of 1988. Like she started the actual proceedings. May 1988 is when she filed for Becky Sue Turner's birth certificate. But you don't just like wake up one day and find somebody that you want to take their identity and file it. You spend months preparing, learning how to do it, especially like how she did it. You spend months learning that. So from what we can piece together, most likely right after she got this letter and realized that people could still easily track her down, she changed her entire identity so that her family wouldn't have any connection to her. And she left $84,000 on the table, never to claim it as her own. What? Who does that? Now, in my opinion, as I look at this case, to me, that says that the trauma she experienced within her childhood 
because I'm sorry, nobody goes through all of this and goes through this length, goes to these lengths of changing their identity without some kind of major trauma happening within their childhood. Like, I'm sorry, but I don't feel like that's a very big stretch. And the fact that she wouldn't even take the $84,000 from her own father makes me feel like whatever the trauma was, was probably from him. Whether that was physical, emotional, sexual abuse, whatever it was, probably came from him. The fact that she was so highly protective of her children, so much to the point that she wouldn't even let Blake's own family to be like left alone with her or watch her or really even hold her, makes me feel like there had to have been trauma for from her own family members onto her for her to like not trust Blake's family like that. Now when somebody goes through trauma as a child, now this can be different for everybody, but it can really push us to try to like look for answers in some way, shape, or form. And for a lot of people, religion can answer those questions or at least fill the holes that we feel like we have in our heart. Case in point, I had some trauma in my childhood and I threw myself into religion. I can relate to Lori doing the same thing. At least that's like what it seems like to me is she had a traumatic childhood. And then as she finally got through college and stuff, she started to throw herself into religion. It gave her a structure. It gave her purpose. And it made her feel loved, which is something she probably didn't have as she grew up. And we know that from the friend who came over to her house and said there's like no camaraderie between the family members and the atmosphere just felt different. And so I think she was probably looking for that and religion is an easy Easy place for somebody to kind of fill that gap within their life and their purpose and in their heart. I think for Lori, and I call her Lori because that was the name she chose, so we're just going to call her Lori. Now, I feel like Lori, looking at all of this kind of in a bigger picture, as all of this chaos is unfolding, I think she probably looked at it and saw that she was the common denominator for all of this. The tension between Blake and her family, um, her running away from her family, the trauma. I feel like she probably held a lot of responsibility and she didn't want to put that on to her own child and have her own child grow up in that turmoil and that stress or whatever it may be. And so she chose to end her life to hopefully give her daughter maybe a better one. That is a theory. I've heard some other people kind of say some similar stuff to that. Um, that could be, or it could have just been that because of this mental breakdown and she couldn't handle it anymore. Depression, it, it was very evident how depressed she was with the state of her own house and it was known by everybody, it was very visible that they were losing weight, her and the baby. I think her depressive state played a vital role if not was the driving force for her to choose to end it, especially in the way that she did end it. I will say it's still very evident that she did not like the roughs. She's always thought that they were against her, which they were. They had this animosity between the two. And so she chose to end her life in the driveway of the rough family as maybe possibly most likely a last kind of like dig at the roughs and be like, mm -hmm. now you have to live with the fact that I did this in your own driveway, um, which I mean, petty, cruel, a little sadistic if I have to say so because that's like your daughter was living and sleeping in that house in that very moment but mental illnesses can make you do absolutely wild things and that's the sad nature of mental illness whether that's depression anxiety or anything of the sort now yes she did not have a diagnosis of any mental illness at this time, but I think it would be hard pressed to find somebody that was like, oh yeah, she was completely mentally stable at this moment in her life. Like everything was pointing to the fact that she was having a complete mental breakdown and she was becoming unhinged. As all of this has come out, Blake said, maybe she wasn't even comfortable around her own self. How would she be comfortable around the family? I'm assuming something really tragic must have happened, something awful is what it appears to me. I think Blake to this day has a lot of empathy and sympathy for Lori. And I think he truly, honestly, from the very beginning did believe that she had just an awful childhood and she was running from that. I think Blake 100% believed her. Um, I do feel like his parents and his family kind of got into his head and maybe sowed some of that division between him and Lori. And I think they had some more negative 
connotations to why she was hiding who she was. I think they did not trust her in the sense of like her having a toxic or awful childhood. I think they very much believed that she was a criminal that was running away from crime or something along those lines. So with telling this story, I have tried to kind of hold that space and be respectful and not super judgmental to the rough family because I understand this case is very convoluted. There's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of thoughts and opinions and views coming into this case. And it's a lot of years that they're dealing with this. So there's definitely way more to this story than what we see and what we've read in the articles. So I've tried to hold that space for them in this and kind of understand where they're coming from. But I still do firmly stand beside the opinion that because they were not trauma informed and because they didn't have the kind of trauma experiences that come with growing up in a poor or average type family, that it didn't give them the ability to understand or hold space for Lori. Now, that doesn't mean I agree with everything that Lori did or how she handled it, but I think she was very broken and needed help. And she tried to get that help by going to church and through religion instead of a mental health professional. That's not to say that going to church and getting advice and guidance is horrible. It's definitely not something I recommend to be your first case if you're struggling with anything mentally. It's just very different coming from a mental health professional who can see the bigger picture and is coming from different points of view and perspectives psychologically instead of just theologically if you get what I'm saying. But moving forward, I do hope that the Ruff family has kind of seen how tragic this case is, how heartbreaking it is to know that there was nothing nefarious. She didn't commit a crime. There was no scam. She didn't do this for money. She was literally just running away from her childhood. And we don't know why. And the only one that knows has taken those secrets to her grave. So I hope with understanding the depth of the tragedy of this case has helped them understand trauma in a much deeper way. And I hope it's helped them see where they kind of went wrong in this whole story and relationship with Lori. And it just pushes them to be a better person, to learn and to grow from this experience. And that they really do truly tell Lori's daughter about her. And even though we can disagree on maybe the reasons why she decided to end her life, that she truly did love her daughter. And that that is not taken away that I hope that daughter really does truly believe that her mom loved her, that Lori desperately loved her, but that she was a broken person in a broken world. And it's honestly just a tragic story. Um, the daughter is, I think, in her teens now. She was born in 2008. So yeah, she's like 15 years old. That's wild. Oh my gosh, she's, she's the same age as my niece. Oh, I did not know that. That's wow. That is the tragic, heartbreaking, and just sad story of Lori Erica Kennedy, formerly known as Kimberly McLean. Before you go, if you liked this video, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and hit that bell so you get notified every time I make an upload. Reminder, my upload schedule is three weeks on, one week off. This is my third video. And so next week there will be no new video. Hopefully before the end of the year, I will be um, just doing them every single week and then only taking a week off sporadically for different things. But that's my goal for right now. I'm sticking with the three weeks on, one week off. So reminder, next week no video I have a massively long list of cases that I want to cover for you guys and so I am in no short supply of cases but I would like to know if you do have a case that is related to religion in some way shape or form and you want me to cover it comment below and I will add it to my list if it's not already on there that's all for now I will see you guys in the next video but until then drink some water take a nap and don't be a dick bye